greetings to all of you. My dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm welcome to all of you from your Pastor Yeti. Before we start a new lesson of um, Acts, put your faith where the action is. I will say the reason why for a couple of days there was no broadcasting was because of a huge of a Wi-Fi and electrical problem. So, but I'm back on track together with you. We're going to go to another journey. And the readings from the study of the book of Acts is now the chapter 17 and 18. This is your Pastor Yadi. Let's pray first before we go in the mood of our study of the book of Acts. Holy Spirit, guide us and teach us how to walk the way that Christ followed in obedience to God. Show us that you reveal truth and wisdom as we go through this lesson. In Jesus' name, amen. So, getting started. Following the famous Ignatian Way, Paul and Silas went 100 miles from Philippi to Thessalonica. Timothy is not mentioned again until Acts 17.14, so he may have remained in Philippi. As far as we can tell, they did not pause to minister in either Amphipolis or Apollonia. Perhaps there were no synagogues in those cities. And Paul certainly expected new believers in Philippi to carry the message to their neighbors. It was Paul's policy to minister in the large cities and make them centers for evangelizing a whole district. Paul knew that the Salonica, our modern Salonica, was a strategic city for the work of the Lord. And not only was it the capital of Macedonia, but it was also a center for business revealed only by Corinth. It was located on several important trade routes, and it boasted an excellent harbor. The city was predominantly Greek, even though it was controlled by Rome. Thessalonica was a free city, which meant that it had an elected citizens' assembly, it could mind its own coins, and it had no Roman garrison within its walls. As a result of three weeks' ministry, Paul saw a large number of people believe, especially Greek proselytes and influential women. Among the men were Aristarchus and Secundus, who later traveled with Paul. See that in Acts 20, verse 4. And Luke's phrase, not a few, Acts 17, 4 to 12 and 12, is a one way of saying it was a big crowd. And we are in the commentary of be daring, the pages 53 to 55. First, who do you think Paul's missionary trips were so effective that what you glean from Acts 17 about Paul's approach to missions? What lessons can we learn from Paul's approach that can be applied to our churches today? And more to consider, the Greek word Translated another in 17.7 means another of a different kind. That is a kind unlike Caesar. Why would the news about a different king cause such a ruckus among the Jews? Second, choose one verse or phrase from Acts 17.18 that stands out to you. And this could be something you're intrigued by, something that makes you uncomfortable, something that puzzles you, well, name it. It's just fine. And write it there in your notebook. Now, going deeper, it's again from the commentary. Under cover of night, Paul and Silas left Thessalonica and headed for Berea, about 45 miles away. It does not appear that Timothy was with them, as he was probably working in Philippi. Later, he would join Paul in Athens. And then he sent to Thessalonica to encourage the church in its time of persecution. Since Timothy was a Gentile and had not been present, mean present, I mean when the trouble erupted, 
he could minister in the city freely. The peace bound could keep Paul out, but it would not apply to Paul's young assistant. Paul went into the synagogue and there discovered a group of people keenly interested in the study of the Old Testament scriptures. And in fact, they met daily to search the scriptures to determine whether or not Paul was saying was true. Paul had been overjoyed at the way the people in Thessalonica had received the word. So these noble variants must have really encouraged his heart. All of us should imitate these variants by faithfully studying God's word daily, discussing it and testing the message that we hear. God used his word so that many people trusted Christ. Page 56. 3. Why did Luke refer to Bereans as being of noble characters? What would this noble character look like in today's believers? And why did the troublemakers in Thessalonica follow Paul to Berea? What was the result of the troublemakers' efforts? How is this like the way some people cause trouble in church today? On commentary, Paul arrived in the great city of the Athens, not as a sightseer, but as a soul winner. Athens was in a period of decline at this time, though still recognized as a center of culture and education. The glory of its politics and commerce had long since faded. It had a famous university and numerous fate beautiful buildings, but it was not the influential city it once had been. The city was given over to a culture of paganism that was nourished by adultery, novelty, and philosophy. Page 57 Christianity may be the world's largest religion, but it's also the media's most popular target when it comes to criticism. Whether it's the national news delivering a story about the pastor's fall from grace or a, a television show or movie poking fun at the practices of faith, Christianity is often portrayed as a religion of hypocrites and fools. And certainly, there are those in the church who make themselves easy targets, but they don't represent the majority of believers. So why is Christianity so often the target of ridicule? What is a right response to these sorts of portrayals of the faith? And how does the media's typical portrayal of Christianity affect the way in which you relate to non-Christians? So the commentary, when you contrast the seeming meaners, um, major results in Athens with the great harvest in Thessalonica and Berea, you are tempted to conclude that Paul's ministry there was a dismal failure. If you do, you might find yourself drawing a hasty and erroneous conclusion. Paul was not told to leave, so we assure he lingered in Athens and continued to minister to both believers and unbelievers. Proud, sophisticated, wise, Athenians would not take easily to Paul's humbling message of the gospel, especially when he summarized all of Greek history in the phrase, the times of this ignorance. The soil here was not deep and it contained many weeds, but there was a small harvest. And after all, one soul is worth the whole world. Page 63. Now read Acts 17, 16 to 34 and compare the experience in Athens to that in Thessalonica 17 verse 1 to 9 and in Berea 17, 10, 15. Why was the experience in Athens so dramatically different for Paul? What was unique about the audience Paul spoke to in the different towns?
So one way Paul separated himself from the religious hucksters was by supporting himself as a tent maker, by providing, by the providings of God. He met a Jewish couple, Aquila and Priscilla, and you can find them Prisca in Second Timothy four nineteen, who were workers in leather, as was Paul. Jewish rabbis did not accept money for their students, but earned their way by practicing a trade. All Jewish boys were expecting to learn a trade, no matter what profession they might enter. He would that he who does not teach his son to work teaches him to steal, said the rabbis. So Paul of Tarsus learned to make leather tents and to support himself in his ministry. See Acts 18, verse 3. And 1 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15, and 2 Corinthians 11, 6 to 10. Also from the commentary by Daring, or Be Daring, page 68. So, how might Paul's experience in Athens have affected his approach to the people in Corinth? Why is it notable that Acts tells about Paul's trade as a tent maker? And how might this trade have helped Paul in his missionary journey? From the commentary, whenever God is blessing a ministry, you can expect increased positions as well as increased opportunities. For a great and effective door as opened to me, there are many adversaries. After all, the enemy gets angry when we invade his territory and liberate his slaves, as in Thessalonica and Berea. The unbelieving Jews who rejected the word stirred up trouble for Paul and his friends. Such opposition is usually proof that God is at work, and this ought to encourage us. And more to consider. To have blood on your hands means that you bear the responsibility for another's death. The image comes from the watchman on the city walls whose task it was to stay alert and warn of coming danger. Ezekiel 3, 17 to 21 and 33 verses 1 to 9. Review Acts 18, 6. What does it mean to have blood on your hands? And see also Joshua 2, verse 19. Looking forward Take a moment to reflect on all that you've explored thus far in the study of Acts 17 and 18. Review your notes and answer and think about how each of these things matters in your life today. Paul's experience in Athens was less effective than his previous stops. When have you felt like Paul did in Athens? How do you deal with the frustrations that come when people just don't understand what you're saying? What are some creative ways to share the message of Christ that people in any culture or circumstances can understand? Think of one or two things that you have learned that you'd like to work on in the coming time you study this book of Acts. And remember that this is not about that is, I mean, it's all about quality and not quantity. Okay. So, do you want to learn how to respond to ridicule? Be specific. Go back to Acts 17 and 18 and put a star next to the phrase, or, first that is most encouraging to you. Consider memorizing this verse. Well, you're all free in doing that. So. The most important thing is, my dear people, is that you read Acts, that you study Acts, but in your own time. But be committed to yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to you and to guide you in everything you do. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye.